welcome to Week in One, the show that catches you up on the top news stories and interviews featured on ENCA over the past seven days. I'm Melissa Duprea. Let's get right into it. Residents evacuated after an explosion rips through Lily and Goy Street in the Joburg CBD. Russian President Vladimir Putin will not be attending next month's BRICS summit following mounting pressure over the expected visit in August. The country and the world celebrates Mandela Day as we reflect on Madiba's legacy and what communities are doing to make a lasting impact in society. And the Senzo Miyiwa trial kicks off anew with a fresh judge in the chair. An explosion that ripped through Lillian Goy Street in the Johannesburg CBD on Wednesday has claimed one life and left over 40 people injured. Some of the busiest streets in the city have been cordoned off after being severely damaged. Emergency services have been assessing the situation as it develops. Our reporter Heidi Jockas has been on the story since it broke. Police have arrived on scene. Uh, interestingly, they are only now uh, cornering off the road and basically stopping anybody from walking here. Uh, my colleague at the Bocha is going to show you um, what is actually going on here. Uh, I don't know if we are allowed to go in uh, at this point uh, just to get some clarity um, uh, and actually just show you the extent of damage. I'm just trying to get uh, an indication from um, the official uh, if we can. So just give me a second, Gareth, as you view those visuals. Um, I just want to ask the... Sorry, can we just go through to just show the extent? Please, we live on ENCA. We just want to go and just stand here and go in. Can we? Are we allowed to? We just want to go in and show the extent. We're live on ENCA. Okay, thank you so much. Um, he has given us a clear to do so. Um, we obviously just need to be a little bit more careful in terms of where we walk. But Gareth, it's a very different picture as I'm showing you um, right now because it is uh, morning and you can actually see what's going on here. Um, I, I cannot even explain to you what this looks like. Uh, it's something I've never seen, the whole road has been literally broken um, and it seems as though uh, you know it's it's literally more than half of the road uh, at this point again we do not know exactly what the cause of all of this is uh, what could have possibly caused this i must indicate that i am smelling some sort of gas in the air um, it, it does smell like there is some gas in the air we're not sure what gas where it's coming from um, but i definitely do smell something What's alarming, Gareth, is that this extends to, uh, I would say, a couple of kilometers. I do know that my colleague, Pule Letwichi Jones, is further up, but you can actually see uh, how this extends for uh, some, some time. And uh, I think further up is the, the extent of where you saw a number of taxis literally piled up next to each other, some on their heads, some on their sides. The recent spate of arson attacks against trucks has resulted in several arrests. The five suspects cuffed in connection with the crimes appeared before the Ermelo Magistrates Court. The high-profile case has been postponed to the 27th of July. ENCA reporter Aviwe Mtile was in court this week. The five accused of torching nine trucks on two separate incidences in Bumalanga made the first appearance at the MLO Magistrate Court. They face charges ranging from robbery with aggravating circumstances, malicious damage to property, as well as attempted murder. Now, inside court was also the MEC of Community Safety, Vusi Shwangwe. MEC, thank you for joining us at ENCA. Uh, they made their first appearances here. Are you sure you have the right people and the five appeared today? We are definitely sure that we have uh, the five uh, correct people according to the police and the information that the police have. You must remember that some of them uh, are appearing on the cameras of the N4 road uh, towards your Mozambique uh, and uh, that one, the N2 to your Peter Tief direction uh, between MLO and Peter Tief. So we we, we are confident, we, we trust our police that have, they have arrested the right people. Have you established what's behind the recent torching of the trucks? Well, the police have established that some of them are former uh, drivers from the different uh, truck companies. Uh, some of them might be aggrieved, you know, of being dismissed from their various companies. And uh, some of them might be part of the syndicates. 
uh, that's highly possible. Some of them might be bought by certain people to effect this particular uh, barbaric act. So there are a number of elements that the police are still investigating. That's why I'm saying I don't think and I don't want to believe that it will end up on these five only. There are some of them that the police uh, might uh, discover and bring them to the book as well. And have we seen the last of the torching of trucks in Bumalanga? Are the drivers safe on their route? No, we can say they are safe. Lieutenant General Manamela have assured us that uh, she has deployed more personnel. And uh, you must remember that the National have also deployed uh, members of SANTF. And uh, there are also private security companies that are very brilliant working together with the police in making sure that they make our roads to be safe, particularly the hotspots. Thank you very much. Now, some of the five have uh, claimed that they've been assaulted by police when they were arrested, and the magistrate suggested that uh, they'll pass the message on to the police that they seek medical attention. The matter has been postponed to the 27th of July uh, for the official bail uh, application, as well as for them uh, to be present with their legal representatives. Abiwem Mdila, Emelo Mpumalang. More than a year after it began, the Senzo Miyua trial started all over again this week with a new judge presiding. An emotional Zandile Kamalo, one of the six people in the house when the soccer star was murdered in 2014, continued her testimony. ENCA Silindelo Masikane had her finger on the pulse with this case and filed this report. More than a year after the initial trial began, the Senzo Miyua murder trial is starting afresh, this time with a new judge in tow. Judge Rada Mokhateng didn't waste any time making his presence felt. You can't address me before you've introduced yourself in court. If I may approach my lawyer. Yeah, approach your clients because it's not clear. You guys have taken the opportunity to discuss such issues. The, the rest of the gentlemen, have you been served with, yeah, with indictments? Have you amended the charge sheets, sir? No, no, my lord. The charges are still Have you acquired same. new witnesses, sir? No, my lord. So the list of witnesses which is enunciated in the charge sheet, are the, are, are, yes. is that also going to be the list of witnesses the, the, who indeed, are going to be led? The, indeed, my lord. Nobody knew comes from the, the planet Mars. <laughs> no, my lord. Everything is still exactly So everything is new, except that it's a new trial. Yes, everything is still exactly Sorry for the tautology. Mokhwateng made it clear to counsel that he wasn't going to entertain any more delays, ordering that the issue of the accused legal fees be dealt with urgently. Where are the offices of the Legal Aid Board? I understand Mr. Nisi knows dying. It's ten, I'm told my lord, it's 10 minutes away from here. It's yeah, here. Why can't I make an order that Mr. Mujutu should come here? So that, because this is an exceptional matter in the sense that uh, a lot of time, I'm told, has been dis mm. dispensed. Questions remain on how the state will proceed. Will previous witnesses be recalled or will the state begin where it left off with Zandi Kumalo in the witness box? Court proceedings are set to resume with the accused putting their pleas on record. Slinda Lomasigan, Pretoria. Stay tuned to Week in One. Coming up, we look at some of the big interviews done by our anchors this week. Welcome back to Week in One. I'm Melissa Duprea. A sigh of relief for South Africa as Russia President Vladimir Putin agrees to skip next month's BRICS summit in South Africa. Instead, he'll send Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Shortly after the news broke, ENCA anchor Baron Hufke spoke to international relations expert Sipaman Lazondi about the significance of the development. Of course, news just in that uh, the Russian president will not be attending the BRICS summit. What do you make of this? Uh, completely expected. Um, it's been a, a scenario place um, before us for a while, a while now that uh, the, uh, to avoid putting South Africa in an awkward position where it would be forced to arrest, but it won't be able to arrest because to arrest the sitting president in the case of Russia would be to, to declare a war against Russia. And then President Putin has decided not to come but to send a, a, a Minister of Foreign Affairs, which is very common 
And many summits, presidents do send ministers where they are unable to come, and it's definitely unable to come because it would be bad for South Africa um, to have to be in an awkward position, which would have been put in had he come. Mm. Uh, let's talk about this. It seems to be just, you know, another case where we see politics and law meet and clash. Um, you know, some would even call it a political law nexus. Maybe your take on this. Yes, it is. In this particular case, it's actually a, a law peace interface as well, uh, in the sense that the, there are times when uh, instruments of justice are not used because they might interfere with the possibility of building a peace process. Um, that was the case with Al Pashing earlier, that the, there was fear across the continent that if you uh, charge Al Bashir or put him in a situation where he's at the charge, then you are forcing him to hold on to the position at all costs, and therefore you are undermining the peace process in Sudan. Similar in this case, given the fact that the African position is that there must be a peaceful settlement in, in, in all this situation, and the arrest warrant is seen as inimical to a possibility of having dialogue and peaceful uh, end to that atrocious war in Ukraine. And indeed, of course, uh, it's a political matter that is now being also handled through instruments uh, of international it, it, it's, a, it's a maze. It's a, it's a complexity. And in the end, it will resolve itself on political ground, it seems to me, a lot more than other grounds. Mandela Day is meant to bring out the best in people and communities. It's about dedicating 67 minutes to changing the world for good. Chefs with Compassion, for example, cooked 67,000 litres of soup in over 90 kitchens around the country. It aimed at feeding vulnerable communities and highlighted food waste and hunger in South Africa. ENCA anchor Cindy Mabe spoke to founding director Chef Ku Pile. This is the best gift I guess one would give to especially the most vulnerable who would not uh, be able to put food on the table. And that gesture alone uh, is a lifeline. Good afternoon. You know, what a special day this is. And it's, it's the spirit of Madiba that we can feel the Madiba magic that's still upon us. And uh, as we celebrate the 10th anniversary of Mandela Day, it's really special. But as you mentioned, you know, it's also uh, an awareness uh, to the two major problems that we have, which is food waste and hunger. And that's exactly the contradiction because there's one opulence on the other side and wastage. And on the other side, we know that millions of South Africans go to bed hungry. We just say these statistics as if it's in the periphery and people uh, are, are starving amongst us. So how does chefs with compassion, you know, go beyond the 67 minutes and beyond Nelson Mandela Day in providing much needed nutrition? So Cindy, um, for us, every day is Mandela Day. This is what we do 365 days uh, a year. As you know, people need to eat and uh, we need to fill in that gap. And that's what Chess of Compassion does on a daily basis. Uh, we have in excess about 35,000 people daily that are reliant on our kitchens. And uh, we've got to work together. We've got to work uh, as a community, as corporates, public sector, private sector. Uh, we've all got to come together and, uh, and this is what we use Mandela Day for, to highlight this uh, in, in, in terms of what Chester Compassion does. And these are our three values uh, system or pillars that we work on, which is rescue, cook and feed. Gift of the Givers has made a final bid to have South African paramedic Gerka van Deventer released. He was abducted by Al-Qaeda in Libya back in 2017. ENCA anchor Tumelo Mototane spoke to founder Imtia Suleiman for details of their latest efforts. How has your engagement been with the Al-Qaeda group? This, of course, in your efforts to try and bring back Gherko van de Fenter back home. You know, in what the intermediate is compared to when it happened a few years ago. In 2019, that's the first time we got involved with the family's request. He was taken in Libya, on, Gherko was taken in Libya on the 3rd of November 2017. It was only around 2019, you know, where the family asked us to get involved. Because initially, it was thought that the, company, the Turkish company that he worked for would be involved in the process. We don't get involved with somebody else is involved. We started negotiations with intermediaries, and at that point, it was flatly refused. When we said the man has no money, he comes to, he works, the company that he started work for, he only has worked for a short while, his family has no money. What complicated was the fact were two things. 
One is a Turkish company paid for three other Turkish citizens that were taken hostage in Libya. Mm -hmm. That's the first problem. That was Libya. And, and the second problem is that the, the Al-Qaeda group bought Falco from the group in Libya, which means they made an initial financial investment and they want the money back. So those two things complicated the process. And of course, we could make more headway because they insisted they wanted the money. Mm. And then, of course, came forward and everything went came to a dead standstill until April of this year. In April of this year, we decided to do it one more time during the month of Ramadan, because in Ramadan, they tend to be more soft. They, do it. they call it the month of mercy. Mm. And we thought, let's try our luck again. The good news is they never told us no. Normally, when you make a request and un for unconditional release, you've got no ransom to say, within 72 hours, they'll tell you get lost. Never, nothing like that happened. We sent a video from the wife, from the son, from the, the MJC, the Muslim Judicial Council. There was a placard demonstration in Pelican Park outside the mosque at prayer time, at fast break time. And within 48 hours, when we sent the stuff to them, they acknowledged it. They said, we've seen it. We're contemplating it. They didn't say no. After the break, drama in court this week during the Inyobeni Tavern trial linked to the tragic deaths of 21 teenagers last year. Welcome back to Week in One. I'm Melissa Dupreo. Legal woes deepen for the owners of Inyobeni Tavern. They're on trial for serving alcohol to minors after 21 young people died there last year. The municipality says that because they contravened several bylaws, their outlet may be demolished. But, as ENCA's Ronald Masinda reports, the owners believe it's just a publicity stunt. Sia Kangela and Rio Gazindevu left the court fuming after being served with court papers. The angry couple says their address is known to the public and that this was done intentionally to try and embarrass them. Is it breaking down your building? No, it's not breaking down Why is this as if have a court? Why do you think Asa Apa will be to the Meanwhile, former bouncer Tembisa Diko told the court that she made a desperate plea to the accused Sia Kangelandevu to get more security after Enyobeni Tavern was overcrowded. She says only two bouncers operated on the day when 21 young people died and that Devu cared less about the ages of his customers. Mr. Devu was there in a meeting when we were talking on the day in question. And when he, when Mr. Trish or DJ Trish insisted that the party was meant for the uh, young, uh, for, for the children, he was listening to that. Yes, he was there when uh, DJ Trish was saying that. Could I put it to you that my client saw that you were conversing so much with your girlfriend and buying alcohol? that he lost faith in you. An 18-year-old also gave evidence about how teenagers younger than the drinking age were allowed inside Enyobeni Tavern. The trial resumes on Thursday. Ronald Masinda, East London. He's dubbed the station Strangler and is believed to be a serial killer of children in the Cape Flats in the Western Cape. Norman Afzal Simons was convicted of kidnapping, rape and murdering 10-year-old Alroy Van Royen in 1995. And he's been granted parole now after spending three decades behind bars. ENCA's Nobusitu Hejana has a story. Now 38 years old, Relton Manuel says he struggled to process the sudden death of his friend. He last saw him on a train on a Friday afternoon in 1994. Manuel was with his mother and two brothers when they met Elroy traveling with an unknown man. Elroy, it's not 
die gaat hij gaat daar eigenlijk met zijn rug achter toe en niet gestaan naar die dier toe en ik heb gezien na ze tranen zo het ga je tijd toe ik van mijn maag gezien wat is lekker ik heb vraag ik zal ik was maar nog een baby ik heb dat kan jong manniki en vaak gezien maar ik wou heel fifi en paar dagen na tijd toe was hij is weg. Manuel's mother Sandra says. She blamed herself after learning that Van Royen had gone missing. I had to say that 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 I had Elroy's family say they will celebrate his 40th birthday at the end of this month with heavy hearts as the person who killed him is expected to be released on parole. Nobesuti Ejana. Cape Town. As part of Nelson Mandela Day celebrations, President Cyril Ramaphosa visited Madiba's birthplace in the Eastern Cape. ENCA senior reporter Sipa Manla Goge was there and filed this report. Remembering the global icon who was forced by circumstances to shape the country's political discourse. One member of the Mandela family is calling on South Africans to show Ubuntu in honoring the late struggle stalwart in dealing with socio-economic challenges. Ubuntu cuts across all the pillars that you've, you've talked about. It cuts across unemployment, it cuts across poverty, it cuts across crime. Provincial authorities concede that more needs to be done to accelerate the pace of basic services provision in one of the poorest provinces in the country. After 30 years, surely we should have uh, moved. Yes, I know we've been coming from a very low uh, base as a province. Uh, uh, the damage that has been caused, if you talk about colonialism and apartheid, you talk more about this province. Despite the ongoing debate about the erection of more statues to honor struggle stalwarts, some believe this could be a game changer in the economic outlook of the country. When you see a statue of liberty, or you see the statue in Rio de Janeiro and other statues or the Taj Mahal, those places are integrated into the local economy. That's why national, provincial, and local government should come together to say, how do we use Madiba as a magnet for economic activities? President Cyril Ramaphosa says statues, monuments, and museums have a key role to play in the political and cultural life of any country. The statues of Madiba are beacons of hope to individuals and communities that are still suffering from the evils of marginalization and the scourges of poverty, inequality, and underdevelopment. The president says the underdeveloped Eastern Cape province should capitalize on modern sectors of the economy to address unemployment and economic development. The Eastern Cape is one of those provinces where we are going to see a lot of renewable energy projects from the sun and from the wind and you also are going to be generating quite a lot of energy for the rest of the country as we move ahead. We're also going to see the automotive sector going to higher levels. President Ramaphosa has urged South Africans to emulate Madiba's spirit and preserve his legacy by just doing good. Sipaman Lakoke, Ekunu, in the Eastern Cape. And that's a wrap from Weekend One. From myself and the team, have a great weekend.